Good evening, and welcome to the um, Methodist Debakey Cardiovascular Journal webcast. I'm Miguel Quinones, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the journal. And this afternoon, we're going to have a one-hour discussion on the current issue of the journal, which is on pulmonary hypertension. And this is an area where a lot of development have happened in the past uh, five to 10 years. Um, we know much better how to define it, how to classify it, how to do diagnostic studies, uh, look at possible etiologies. And definitely in the area of management, there's been a lot of new things that have come up. So um, we thought that this was a perfect time to give an update on this such important topic. And this is a topic that is, uh, is frequently managed either by cardiologists or pulmonologists or, some, or as we do in our institution, frequently by both of them combined together. And we have two experts in this area here at Houston Methodist. Um, both were kind enough to accept the invitation to be the guest editors for this issue. So it's my pleasure to introduce, on my left, uh, Dr. Sandeep Sahai, who is the co-director of the STEF uh, Pulmonary Hypertension Program uh, here at Houston Methodist. And to his left is uh, Dr. Um, Ashrish Guha, who is uh, also the director of pulmonary hypertension in the Department of Cardiology and uh, director of the uh, heart transplant program, assistant uh, professor of cardiology and a wonderful person to work with. We have been working together for several years. Before I go on, um, remind everybody, if you have any questions that you want to submit to us, uh, text the Bakey to 37607 and uh, send us your, your questions. And without any further delay, I put uh, this uh, hour in the hands of the great guest editor. So who's going to start first? Thank you, Dr. Quinones, and um, thank you, Debeki Education. I'm glad to be here with Dr. Guha, my colleague, my friend, and, uh, and on behalf of the journal and uh, to bo from both of us, uh, we would like to thank each of our uh, authors uh, who participated enthusiastically to make this uh, issue a success. And uh, today in this uh, next one hour, we will be discussing different topics which we have covered in this issue. Um, with that, I would like to uh, ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Guha here, to share some of his thoughts uh, about the issue and also the topic which we have discussed in, the, in this issue of the journal. Well, thanks, Sandeep. Uh, again, to echo what uh, Sandeep just said, I, uh, you know, uh, really heartfelt thanks to all the authors <coughs> and uh, all of you who are here uh, this evening, and uh, especially uh, Dr. Jean-Luc Vacheri, who's, uh, it's almost like nighttime in Europe. Thank you very much for, you know, uh, joining us. Uh, and, uh, uh, and all of you, I, I realize you're on different uh, time zones as well. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, just to um, uh, quickly get started with uh, uh, our article, which was on evaluation, uh, diagnosis, and classification of pH. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, most of you know, the, the definition of uh, pH itself underwent a little bit of a change in uh, uh, the 2018 um, symposium at, uh, uh, at Nice. And, uh, um, the mean PA pressure cutoff was changed from 25 to 20 with PVR and wedge pressure cutoffs remaining the same at 15 of wedge and 3 of PVR. Uh, <coughs> Sandeep, in terms of our experience, it doesn't seem like it's made a big change, at least in the number of patients we have uh, been treating with pH, maybe you know one or two patients uh, at the most per year who have uh, you know, gained uh, uh, in terms of being able to ac have access to treatment? Well, uh, well thanks, Ash. Uh, I think this is a little bit evolving phase right now. We just uh, sort of implemented and now as clinicians and researchers are becoming more and more aware, we are seeing some new evidence and I think it becomes uh, uh, more relevant in at-risk population like scleroderma, sort of like as we know that this in 2013, there was a big single center study which clearly showed that borderline pH patient, as per the older definition, um, had uh, outcome, poor outcomes and, and impaired activity. 
And uh, I think uh, the, 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 the rationale behind changing the definition was because uh, the normal mean PAP is around 14, and if you look at two standard deviation of that is around 20. So, so anything above that is technically uh, abnormal, and that's one of the uh, the reason to change the definition. And I think uh, as I think by the time of next World Symposium, we probably will have uh, enough evidence to really support this early diagnosis. So, uh, well, I think uh, one of the another highlight highlights in our uh, article of this issue is uh, about the algorithm for the early referral to the expert center, which I think this is a sentiment which has been echoed in the European guidelines also and also in the World Symposium that if you have a suspicion for high to intermediate risk pH patient early uh, referral to the expert pH center and I guess uh, that's one of the important factors in the management of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, with that, I think I would like to move on to our authors to start discussing about their articles. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Tonili, Adriana Tonili from uh, Cleveland Clinic. He is, uh, uh, I have non known him for a really long time and uh, uh, he is a, a pul pulmonary critical care physician and he has a research and clinical interest in pulmonary hypertension, uh, very well known for his works in the hemodynamics. And in this issue, he covered a uh, topic of uh, novel treatment targets in PAH. So with that, uh, I would like Dr. Tonili to, to share his uh, topic and uh, his article. Well, thank you, Sandeep, for the uh, kind invitation. Um, uh, as you know, uh, the mortality of uh, pulmonary hypertension continues to be elevated uh, in spite of uh, current treatments with the mortality at 50% uh, at uh, seven years, according to the Reveal Registry. So certainly new therapies are needed, and there are a bunch of pathways uh, that uh, could be um, explored, and there are uh, some uh, potential therapies uh, are uh, very promising. Um, one of those is the imbalance between the BMPR2 and the uh, transforming growth factor uh, beta signaling. And there's one uh, uh, treatment there, so tatercept. Uh, that uh, has recently shown in a phase two uh, great uh, uh, data. Um, this uh, molecule is a selective uh, ligand trap for members of the TGF uh, beta superfamily, such as activin A and B, and uh, enhances the BMPR2 signaling, which is uh, the good guy. And uh, the results of this pulsar study in a phase two. Uh, showed that um, uh, patients with pulmonary artery hypertension that were randomized to the subcutaneous medication every 21 uh, days had a decrease in the PVR when compared to placebo at 24 weeks and also had, had improvements in six minute walk. Um, and the phase three studies, uh, several of them are uh, currently uh, ongoing. Um, other promising uh, pathways uh, include the uh, platelet-derived growth factor signaling with uh, inhalimatinib and GB002, uh, styrosine kinase uh, receptor uh, inhibitors um, that will also decrease the uh, endothelial, the, the pulmonary artery cells growth and proliferation. VIP signaling, a vasodilator with the VIP uh, an analog um, Pensivital deal, or uh, <laughs> it's a little um, hard to pronounce, but uh, the medication is in the screen. Um, and then the metabolic function uh, that it can also is affected in pH that are medications that can revert it, such as metformin, increasing the insulin resistance that's currently under study. Uh, there are other ones that are trying to balance the estrogen signaling with uh, the use of tamoxifen and astrosol and the hero um, happy uh, estrogens. Uh, and then uh, the um, factors, the NRF2 um, transcription factor modulators that will decrease NF-kappa B signaling. 
uh, such as Vardoxolone, although that study um, has been uh, uh, put on hold uh, based on interim analysis and COVID. And then the, the mTOR pathway with the mammalian target of uh, rapamycin uh, and the use of uh, molecules, um, the use of sirolimus and uh, albumin bond uh, nanoparticle and may also uh, be a promising molecule that's currently in study in uh, phase uh, one. Um, so all these, I think, are the most uh, uh, promising pathways, and there are other ones that are um, being uh, under development or, or on the early phases of studying, uh, such as the denervation of the pulmonary artery, the uh, blockers of receptors of oral thromboxane, and the medication called um, samicastad, uh, which uh, inhibits the biosynthesis of uh, norepinephrine. Um, so those are the ones that are pretty much uh, 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 important uh, pathways that are described in the, the paper uh, that you guys published. And, um, and there's some uh, exciting uh, results that hopefully will change the practice in the future years. That's it, Jerome. <clears throat> Well, thanks, Dr. Tonelli. Uh, thank you for that uh, summary of your article. And I agree with you that this is an exciting time in the in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension with more and more uh, disease-modifying agents uh, uh, showing us some success in the trials. Well, with that, I would let Dr. Guha take over and uh, move on to yeah. our next uh, author. Yeah, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Jean-Luc Vacheri from uh, uh, Erasmus <laughs> University in, in Brussels. Uh, Dr. Vacheri, if you could uh, uh, give us some of the highlights of your article and uh, sure. also let I us know about how, how, you know, wh where do we go from here with the group two uh, pH? Yeah, Th thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you, for, for this invitation and for inviting me and my colleague Francesca Macera to write a, an article in the journal. Well, we're, we're just talking about the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension, that is group two pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, which is a, a actually not really a disease, but a condition that is defined by an increase in pressure. Not all patients with uh, heart diseases do develop pulmonary hypertension, and not all of them do really have significant pulmonary vascular disease. So we're talking here about a very small subset of cases, a very small subset of patients. Um, one of the difficulties we have sometimes is to make the distinction between pulmonary hypertension, especially in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as opposed to idiopathic pH. But we have hints now and we have scoring systems that helps us really teasing out what is the difference between a patient really has group two uh, as opposed to a patient who has uh, idiopathic pH with uh, a huge cardiovascular uh, burden in terms of comorbidities. Now, I, I guess that the main lesson we need to learn from, uh, from the past is that we do not have specific therapies for uh, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, even with a pre-capillary component. So the first step we will have to make is to um, really focused on the heart first. So we first need to fix whatever's wrong with the left heart, treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. HFPEF, we know there's not much we can do, but at least control atrial fibrillation, treat obesity, uh, control risk factors, common risk factors for cardiovascular uh, disease or atherosclerosis. And of course, in patients with valvular heart disease, we, we, we should fix whatever can, can be fixed. Um, and that may include um, um, uh, TAV or, or other uh, percutaneous intervention. Now, when we're left with those patients and really have a, a significant precapillary component um, and, and what we call a right ventricular phenotype, unfortunately, we've tried to use pH treatments or at least pH-approved therapies and all of the treat, uh, all of the studies that were performed so far um, were unsuccessful, uh, meaning that either the endpoint was uh, not maybe the most appropriate, but um, the studies didn't reach the primary endpoint. And in some cases, we had uh, safety signals that led to uh, interruption of some of these trials. So at this stage, we have no specific therapies. That said, 
And, and of course, we don't recommend uh, using such therapies in patients with any cause of left heart disease induced pulmonary hypertension. That said, th there are common pathways between IPH and group two pulmonary hypertension, especially in pulmonary hypertension due to HFREF. We have new targets coming that might be of a great interest and we will probably see in the future a couple of trials surely moving away from the traditional three pathways we use in pulmonary arterial hypertension, exploring, exploring sorry, new, 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 new avenues. And uh, uh, Dr. Tonelli talked about Sotatacept. We, we will probably have a trial soon uh, with Sotatacept in group two pulmonary hypertension in patients with significant pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, we need to focus on the right population, find the right endpoint, and uh, we, we hope that in the future we may have some specific therapies for that small subset of cases who do really have pulmonary vascular disease. So that, that's in a nutshell the content of the, uh, the article, and I, I, I couldn't stop uh, before uh, thanking my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Francesca Machera, who's a, a fellow we have in Brussels on secondment from the Milan Ninguarda University Hospital, uh, and who really uh, was instrumental and helped me to write this, uh, this article in the journal. But, and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully some of these developments in uh, in uh, in PAH will translate into uh, better therapies for group two PH as well. And hopefully <laughs> with this uh, uh, data coming out with uh, empagliflozin uh, in HFPEF might uh, translate into some benefits for uh, our patients with uh, group two PH as well. Yeah, that, that's what we hope. I mean, probably this might modify the course of the disease and, and perhaps at least decrease the number of patients who will evolve towards uh, real pulmonary vascular disorders. And, and, uh, and, and this famous precapillary component that we're still struggling to define properly. May I ask a question? Yeah. You know, these patients have um, heart failure. They have elevation of left atrial pressures, but on top of that, they have uh, severe pulmonary hypertension with precapillary pulmonary hypertension. So most cardiologists obviously use diuretics. And my question <coughs> is, in this subgroup of patients, um, are, there, have you, are there any rules of um, how best to use di diuretics? I mean, is there like too much diuresis is not good? Maybe li let them be a little wet? Uh, or should we go for staying dry even though the pulmonary pressures remain elevated. Any, any ideas on how to manage diuretics in these patients? Thank you, Dr. Quinones. This is a, this is a very, very important question. I think we should manage diuretics the same way we would manage diuretics in, in heart failure. Most of the patients will have a, a, a passive component that is that the increase in left atrial pressure will immediately translate to the pulmonary pressure. So if you, if you decrease left atrial pressure, pulmonary pressures will go down and we data from cardiomems that are really suggesting this. In fact, this is what, what is done. Now, th does that really prevent um, down the road the development of pulmonary hypertension? Uh, I think nobody really knows that. We have, uh, again, no rules and no rule of thumb uh, on the use of diuretics. But I would say that uh, at our center, we use, of course, a, a, a furosemide or bumetanide, and, and we use a lot of spironolactone in those cases. That seems to have an effect not only, perhaps not on the pulmonary pressure, but at least on the stiffness of the left atrium and, and perhaps reduce the risk to uh, enter into permanent atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think, uh, uh, Sandeep, do you want to sure. introduce there? Well, thanks, Dr. Vicheri. Thank you so much. And uh, Thank you. With that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my friend and uh, colleague from Canada, Jason Weatherall, and he is assistant professor with the University of Calgary. And uh, uh, thank you, Jason, for being here, and uh, thank you for your work in the issue. Uh, we would like to discuss about group 3 pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertension in chronic lung disease and it's it's a it's a hot topic for this year as we all are aware with the increased trial uh, results findings and subsequently FDA approval for first therapy in in this group uh, patient so with that I would let Dr. Vedaral to talk a little bit about that thanks Andy thank you for the kind introduction. Um, 
I will uh, just go over my objectives here. So briefly, I'll go over the mechanisms of pulmonary hypertension and chronic lung disease and how they influence our management. Uh, also to understand some of the features that help you clinically differentiate between chronic lung disease related pH from group one PAH. And then I'll uh, do a brief overview of the evidence for PAH therapies in this group of patients with uh, chronic lung disease related pulmonary hypertension. So in the most recent classification from NICE, uh, here are the five groups and lung diseases actually fall into two of the potential groups. So group three is, is mostly lung diseases and chronic hypoxia. So this includes obstructive, uh, restrictive lung diseases, as well as mixed disorders, hypoxia without lung disease, um, which would include severe sleep disordered breathing. But there's also several lung diseases in group five, which is uh, pulmonary hypertension due to unclear and multifactorial mechanisms. There are diseases such as um, COPD, interstitial lung disease, and then in group five, sarcoidosis, uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, as well as uh, lymphangioleiomyomatosis, a rare lung disease that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. So there are, are several ways that pulmonary hypertension develops in chronic lung disease. Importantly, destruction of the vascular bed reduces the vascular surface area, so resistance to blood flow will go up, so pulmonary vascular resistance and mean pulmonary pressure will go up. In conditions of chronic hypoxia, we have vasoconstriction in the pulmonary circulation as well as remodeling when it's chronic. A lot of chronic hypoxemia can lead to secondary polycythemia, and this will, to some extent, increase the pulmonary vascular resistance as the blood becomes more viscous. Uh, inflammation, so inflammatory lung diseases and the systemic inflammation associated with many of these diseases may uh, lead to vascular remodeling and obstruction in the lungs. Importantly, especially in COPD, there's a mechanical effect of hyperinflation on the small pulmonary blood vessels, which can cause them to collapse and has influences on pulmonary vascular resistance. And as, as most of us who are clinicians know, these diseases rarely exist in isolation. A lot of these patients have comorbidities, including thromboembolic disease, comorbid left heart disease, and uh, sleep disordered breathing. So uh, how do we differentiate these patients? So uh, the figure on the left is one that I quite like from a, a recent article showing how patients with lung disease can have a pulmonary vascular phenotype uh, represented by PVP here, which is more closely related to pulmonary arterial hypertension, potentially, uh, as opposed to the classic pulmonary hypertension related to lung disease. So on this graph, we have uh, the severity of pulmonary hypertension on the y-axis and the uh, severity of underlying lung disease. And so pulmonary hypertension is, is quite common in chronic lung disease. It's usually proportional to the amount of lung disease, but there are rare patients uh, that more closely resemble group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. And in this figure on the right from the uh, article in, in the journal, um, we uh, proposed some of the features that may help you distinguish between group one and group three. And uh, a lot of these are based on the recent world symposium. So in general, the worse the lung disease, the more likely it is group three. But in many cases, it is uh, unclear and there may be overlap. And, and that's for clinical experience and uh, additional tests, um, such as cardiopulmonary exercise testing may be helpful. So how do we treat pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung disease? This is the theme of the article. In general, as with left heart disease, the treatment should be focused at the underlying condition. So in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we wanna maximize bronchodilation, uh, sort of reduce hyperinflation. And in patients who are hypoxemic, long-term oxygen may have some beneficial effects on the vasoconstriction component, as well as uh, the effects on the right ventricle. Uh, importantly, we need to identify their comorbidities and treat those as this may have um, uh, synergistic effects on pulmonary pressures. And we must never forget that for eligible patients uh, to consider lung transplantation because uh, universally the presence of pulmonary hypertension is associated with a poor prognosis in chronic lung diseases. When using pulmonary arterial hypertension therapies, we have to exercise some caution the lungs have evolved a very adaptive mechanism called hypoxic vasoconstriction, where um, poorly uh, ventilated and hypoxic uh, lung units will have vasoconstriction and pulmonary vasodilators interfere with this uh, mechanism and can lead to worsening hypoxemia. So there have been studies, there have been several trials that we outlined in the article, uh, mostly small trials that have looked at pH therapies in a variety of lung diseases. Unfortunately, as is the story in the left heart um, disease world, most of these studies are negative. 
Um, in COPD, we've evaluated phosphodiesterase inhibitors as well as um, endothelin receptor antagonists with uh, conflicting results, most of the studies showing no improvements in meaningful outcomes. Importantly, in pulmonary fibrosis, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there's actually been studies showing evidence of harm with endothelin receptor antagonists. But more recently, as uh, Sandeep just uh, alluded to, the increased trial that used inhaled troposomal showed some potential benefit in interstitial lung diseases. Sarcoidosis is a rare disease. There has been one RCT that looked at both sentin, which showed some improvements on hemodynamics, but there was really no effect on clinical outcomes. Uh, lastly, I just want to highlight this trial recently published in the last year, which has a lot of us in the field excited, um, has FDA approval. We're hoping for this soon in Canada. Um, and the increased trial was a randomized controlled trial that put over 300 patients into inhaled troposinol or placebo. And there was a significant improvements in the six-minute walking distance, which is the, usually the primary endpoint in trials of new therapies. And this really seemed to be um, beneficial in the patients who had high pulmonary vascular resistance because it's an inhaled medication, it seems to avoid those problems with worsening hypoxemia as the drugs really only delivered to lung units with uh, adequate ventilation. And so this is a very exciting uh, option for a very sick group of patients. Uh, looking forward to seeing more real world data with this in the future. Happy to take any questions. Uh, here's some photos of where I live. Thank you for involving me in this. Well, that was excellent, Jason, and oh, well, those are nice views. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thanks for the excellent summary. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to move to uh, Dr. Murthy and Dr. Benza. Uh, Dr. Murthy is uh, Assistant Professor of Cardiology in Montefiore Medical Center, New York, and Dr. Benza is very well known for his pioneering work in risk stratification in pulmonary hypertension. He's Director, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, Ohio State. Um, Dr. Benza, Dr. Murthy, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about your uh, article and what all you're covering about the risk stratification in PAH? Okay, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to try to fly through our article uh, about the evolution of risk in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So the rationale, I think I don't really need to remind you all now, but it's, it's still a chronic disease. Despite our 14 different therapies, it still has a very high morbidity mortality. Uh, risk assessment is, an, is integral to the management. It should really dictate when to escalate therapy and when to refer for lung transplantation. So I want to first dive right in to the first non-modifiable risk, which is demographics. Um, this is a female predominant disease, yet women tend to fare better than men. So there's this whole paradox with estrogen that perhaps this has been implicated in, in improved survival. And uh, perhaps there's some protective data, protective uh, aspect of estrogen to the RV. The race and ethnicity issue has been quite interesting in the last couple of years with the advent of ancestry data. There was a large study in 2020 uh, looking at not only self-reported race and ancestry, but uh, also race and ethnicity rather, but also correlating that to ancestry data. And it turns out that Hispanic and Native American status actually had uh, improved survival, whereas African-American women had worse survival. Um, and this was also correlated in, in death uh, registries where increased mortality was seen in African-American women, and it's a little bit unclear on to what this uh, disparity is, is attributed to. So the other point to make is that all registry data suggests that connective tissue disease patients have worse survival. And in fact, in our reveal registry, which is the largest U.S. experience, has about 25% of mixed connective tissue disease patients. So we have a lot of data to back this up. Moving on to functional class, the NYHA or WHO functional class are the most widely used, but this is a subjective exercise capacity assessment. Despite this subjective nature, this is a study that was looking at patients on epoprosinol for more than a year, and it was actually able to stratify very well using the functional class and the NYHA class as far as survival goes. So, so the six minute walk distance, we're all pretty familiar with because it was widely used as primary endpoint for most PAH trials prior to 2013. 
but this was largely unsubstantiated. So in 2015, the reveal investigators, what they did was they did a rigorous evaluation of the six minute walk distance and they had three distinct conclusions from this. Number one was that survival was lowest in those with a six minute walk distance of under 165 meters and highest in those over 440. Second, the worsening of the six minute walk distance actually translated to worse survival. And finally, most interestingly, is that improvement in six minute walk distance did not translate to improvement in survival. And this is important because again, prior to 2015, most, most PAH trials looked at six minute walk distance as a primary endpoint. Uh, CPET on the other hand is, is much more comprehensive, but requires expertise and performance and interpretation, but it can provide a lot of information. And here are some of the parameters that have been shown to have important prognostic um, data in, in PAH. One is peak VO2, the VCO2 slope, and so on. Coming to imaging, uh, echocardiography is the most widely used and cheapest to perform, um, but importantly, not one parameter um, shines above the others in, in, in giving a global view of the RV function. So probably more of a composite view, looking at things like RA press, pressure estimation by IVC, RA size, TAPC, which is the tricuspid annular plane of systolic exertion, excursion, um, the, functional, the fractional area change, as well as the tie index, which is a marker of myocardial performance. So all of these put together can give you a global view. The MRI offers a much more accurate and precise view of the RV. Um, through 4D imaging especially, there's a, a much more superior analysis of pulmonary uh, circulation, uh, mass and volume quantification. And in fact, the repair trial in 2020 showed an improvement in RV stroke volume by MRI. And this was really the first large scale therapy trial incorporating MRI based uh, endpoints. Hemodynamics, uh, going back to 1981, which was the first registry that we have available of 187 patients, there were certain uh, parameters that emerged as having strong prognostic data. One was elevated RA pressure. The second was decreased cardiac index. And lastly was mean PA pressure. And all of these uh, pointed to higher mortality. Now in the 2010 uh, reveal registry, the strongest hemodynamic variable is actually PVR over 32, as well as mean, P, mean RA pressure. In 2015, the ESC ERS guidelines were published, and this is based on cons expert consensus, and RA pressure, cardiac index, and venous oxygen saturation were included as important prognostic signs. Of note, mean PA has never been shown to be a strong prognostic indicator since that first 1981 study. The last thing I want to touch on is DLCO uh, and some genetic and lab data. Um, the reveal registry found that DLCO under 32% was, was the highest risk category. And in fact, about 70% of PAH patients have a DLCO of less than 80%. So this is kind of in line with that and um, has been shown to be a very important prognostic point in the PFTs. Laboratory analysis, BNP and NT pro BNP have been longstanding surrogates of cardiac function. So there, there's an obvious predictive role in RV failure here. Uh, ST2 has also been associated with higher PA pressures, higher pulmonary vascular resistance, as well as lower six minute walk distance. I just wanna to touch quickly on the genome wide association studies because I think there's been a lot of um, buzz about this lately. And the largest study looked at over 2000 patients with PAH. And of all the genes found uh, in, in this, all these pathological variants found, the HLA DPB1 was, a, was specifically very interesting because there is variants that caused a worse survival. So the TT genotype had a median survival of seven years versus the CC genotype median survival of 13.5 years. So it's very interesting that in addition to, um, to uh, everything else we know, this may play a role in, in prognostication and going forward. So just some final thoughts to close this out. Um, thinking about the, the NIH registry in 1981, this was really the landmark uh, data that provided the groundwork for a lot of worldwide registries therefore coming forward. So the Compare registry was out of Germany, the SPAR is out of Sweden, Sweden, and obviously the French PH network in France. All of these kind of lended to the ESC ERS guidelines, which is a very simple, everybody's kind of seen this traffic-like pattern and very, very, 
easy to follow, simple uniform approach to looking at pulmonary hypertension. But there's a couple of things to mention with this, uh, the ESC consensus-based document. Um, one is that the pH groups were generally limited to idiopathic or heritable or drug-induced pH. Um, and also just a note that all of these values have a fixed value placed on them, meaning that basically this implies that all parameters hold equal importance. And this may or may not be true. And also as we've evolved, we've learned that there's a lot of uh, non-modifiable variables that play in a role into prognostication, such as male and mixed connective tissue disease. So that's really where the REVEAL 2.0 registry tried to overcome some of these limitations by combining both modifiable and non-modifiable risks. And this registry was built on prevalent and incidence cases and allows us to kind of treat risk as a moving target. The REVEAL 2.0 uses about 13 different variables and also breaks down uh, patients into low, medium, and high risk, intermediate and high risk categories. And it certainly provides greater discrimination than the ESC ERS based guidelines, but it, it does have a, a lot more parameters involved and some of them are invasive parameters. So the REVEAL Light 2 risk calculator um, can be successfully used to approximate risk. And all of these are six variables, pretty all non-invasive, something that you can easily get in, during every clinic visit. Um, the push towards simplification is important so that we increase utilization, but it's really important to keep in mind that on an individual patient level, multiple parameters are, are probably most beneficial. And overall, I think whichever risk score we use, the goal in any of our clinical practices is to get that low risk status. And while this may not be possible, that's the kind of impetus to refer to expert centers versus expedite timely lung transplant evaluations. And that's where I'm gonna end. I just wanna thank everybody for this opportunity, especially Dr. Benza for allowing me to, uh, to, to collaborate with him on this really important topic. And of course the Debakey cardiovascular program. Very good. Well, thanks, Dr. Murthy. That was uh, very detail-oriented. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, is Dr. Benza there? I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. So, uh, Dr. Benza and Dr. Murthy, well, thank you for this uh, uh, wonderful topic and article. I just have a quick question for you. Uh, what do you envision from here in the risk stratification in pH? What, what further refinements you would like to see like one of the sort of I think criticism of the risk scores we generally talk about that they lack the imaging uh, parameters or you know the echo importance to echo is not that much so what do you think uh, from here what further or what should be our approach and one of the other question as a follow-up to that is uh, generally the uh, we hear about the prospective evaluation of the risk stratification scores and how they affect the outcome. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, they are all, all great questions. And I, and I wanted to thank my very talented co-author because I think she did an amazing job with that presentation and really picked up all the salient points, the most important of which is that risk stratification should be used when we're evaluating our patients. and and that physician shouldn't only use clinical gestalt. It's, uh, it's like a very powerful hammer in your tool belt uh, that should be used in conjunction with you know, your best feelings about how a patient should be treated. But I bet you mentioned uh, some of the shortcomings uh, and none of, these, uh, none of these risk calculators were ever meant to be set in stone. They're always an evolution and process. And, and I do believe that imaging is a very important part of risk stratification. And you know, typically I will use uh, the risk calculator plus uh, uh, an imaging uh, modality together when I evaluate full risk. So I do think that is an important component uh, that needs to be added to some of these uh, future uh, versions of these calculators and that there is work being done in this. And um, as uh, Dr. Murthy said, uh, personalized approach to medicine, they're important too. And uh, the information coming on, on genomics and other biomarkers uh, that uh, really 
uh, tell us uh, more about this disease from their early uh, state are also going to be important components, I think, to add into these for stratification systems. So I think a lot of evolution is going on with these. You need to stay tuned for these. But I think the bottom line here is that you should be using risk stratification tools when you make decisions about patients and uh, keep your eyes on the literature because uh, they will be evolving. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benzo. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. With that, uh, I'll let Dr. Guha take over from here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Valeria Duarte, who is uh, 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 one of our dearest colleagues in the adult congenital uh, heart uh, adult congenital heart uh, program, and she's going to talk about uh, um, evaluation of and management of pH with uh, um, patients with adult congenital heart disease. Valeria, I can see your slides. I think you're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes, it, yes, can yes, you hear yes, me? we can hear you. Okay, okay, you can see my slides, right? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guja and Dr. Quiñones and, and Dr. Shahey for this opportunity. I would like to acknowledge my brilliant co-author, Hassan Arshad, who is one of the talented cardiovascular fellows here at the Houston Methodist. Um, I'm going to quickly walk you through the article um, that, that you will see in this issue. Uh, as you all know, Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a common complication in, in patients with congenital heart disease. Um, the populations based studies have reported that between 6 to 28% of adults with congenital heart disease are diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. So it's a frequent problem. Um, it does aggravate the natural course of the underlying defect and complicates the management. Uh, Pulmonary PAH has a multifactorial etiology in these patients as well. Um, it depends on the size and the nature of the cardiac defect, and also it depends on genetic and environmental factors. The most frequent cause of pulmonary hypertension in adult congenital heart disease are, are unrepaired defects um, in which there is a unrestricted flow from the left circulation to the right in general. Um, so this leads to pressure and volume overload of the pulmonary circulation, uh, which leads to changes in, in the medium and small arteries uh, of the pulmonary vasculature uh, related to vasoconstriction, endothelial proliferation, uh, obstructive remodeling, inflammation, and also thrombosis. Um, this ultimately leads to an increase in pulmonary artery pressures. Uh, when the pulmonary artery pressures reach suprasystemic values, this can lead to a shunt reversal. So we then have a patient with a right to left shunt, uh, which consequently leads to cyanosis, and this is known as the Eisenmenger syndrome. Um, the clinical implications of pulmonary hypertension in, in the congenital heart disease populations are broad, but most importantly, pH increases the all-cause mortality uh, by twofold in these patients, and it also increases morbidity uh, with heart failure and arrhythmias by threefold compared to patients with congenital heart disease without pulmonary arterial hypertension. And that's why it's so important uh, to, uh, to perform appropriate surveillance for pulmonary hypertension. It also increases resource utilization and admissions to intensive care units of this patient. Um, so how do we classify these patients? It's, it's complex because as you know, this is a very heterogeneous population, but broadly um, in one, uh, this is the clinical classification of PAH in congenital heart disease that was originally presented in the fifth world symposium and it has remained unchanged since. Um, it, you can see we have four 
clinical and phenotypical groups. And uh, in the first one, at, in one end of the spectrum is Eisenmenger syndrome. These are usually patients with large um, intracardiac and extracardiac defects um, that initially have systemic to pulmonary shunts. And then over time with the, with progressive elevation of the PVR reverse to pulmonary to systemic or bidirectional shunting. Uh, this, this is a syndrome. It, 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 the patients present with cyanosis, erythrocyte, secondary erythrocytosis, and usually they have also multi-organ involvement. Um, uh, in the second group, we have patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, that is associated with systemic to pulmonary shunt. So these are usually, um, these are defects that can be corrected if the PVR is not very high. Uh, and, and, and briefly, the current guidelines recommend that we close this defect when the QPQS is, is hemodynamically significant, meaning Great, equal or greater than 1.5 to 1 uh, with symptoms and ventricular dilation. As long as the pulmonary pressure, the, pulmon the systolic pulmonary pressure is less than 50% of the, of the systolic systemic pressure and the PVR is less than one third of the SVR. Um, th those are the criteria criteria for closure in the AMIRF by the ACCHA guidelines for the management of congenital heart disease. We should know that, uh, that patients who have severe pulmonary hypertension uh, in, in, have a, a clear contraindication for closure. Um, there are patients that are in a gray zone. They need to be evaluated by specialists in, in, in who can find potential targets for treatment, and then they may become eligible for closure. Uh, the European guidelines support closure with, a fen with fenestrated patches, so that can be a possibility. Um, the third group are patients with pulmonary hypertension and small and coincidental defects. These are patients in, in whom the the pulmonary pressures are very elevated and the size and characteristics of the defect do not explain uh, the, the development of pulmonary hypertension. So we feel these are coincidental and, and, and addressing the cardiac defect is not the center of treatment here. Uh, and then we have patients who have pulmonary hypertension after defect correction, this unfortunately does happen. Um, and, and in these patients who have a defect that was rightly closed, uh, pulmonary hypertension persists, and this probably say, speaks to a substrate. These patients probably have abnormal pulmonary vasculature to begin with. Um, so there have been several trials and studies looking at targets for treatment uh, in, uh, of patients with congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, mainly focused in patients with Eisenmenger. Um, the BREATHE 5 was the, an early one, and I think the most remarkable one, uh, looking at Vocentan in patients with Eisenmenger that showed improved exercise capacity and hemodynamics. Um, so we, we do use placentan in patients with Eisenmenger unless there are contraindications. There are several studies in patients with Fontan circulation. Um, as you know, in uh, patients with Fontan circulation have a single ventricle and the, the flow across the pulmonary uh, vasculature is passive and is uh, and it depends on low pulmonary pressure. So it, 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 it's, it's, logical to think that keeping these pressures low will help them. Um, so there have been a, there have been some interest in the in the recent past looking at PDF phosphodiesterase uh, inhibitors, which have shown some promise. So we do use uh sildenafil in these patients, Tadalafil as well. Um, so just to 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 summarize what you'll find in this article um, timely repair of hemodynamically significant shunts is a cornerstone of therapy. Um, patients with significant shunts who have already developed pulmonary hypertension should be evaluated and treated in a center with expertise. And 
patients with Eisenmengers have increased morbidity and mortality. And, and there is some growing evidence of, of pulmonary vasoactive agents in patients with Eisenmengers and Fontan. So that gives hold some, holds hope for patients whose prognosis sometimes it's, it's a grim and have very have very limited op therapeutic options. And well, with that, I will finish. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you, Valeria, for this uh, comprehensive review of your uh, article. And uh, I think uh, it's my pleasure again to uh, invite uh, Dr. Zina Safter, who is uh, the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program in the uh, Lung Center. And she's going to talk about her uh, article in uh, uh, on, on CTEF and medical management of CTEF. You're Zenith, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. And can you see my slides? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to give a... Um, professor. Hold on a second. Can you see the second slide? No. Okay, can you see the second slide? No. No. No, okay, sorry. How about now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to talk about the medical management of uh, uh, CTAF, and it is, of course, a topic that uh, was reviewed in this uh, article. Thank you for the kind invitation, and I'm presenting on, on uh, behalf of my first author, uh, Dr. Ryan Logue, who is a pulmonary critical care fellow. So um, I, uh, we are part of the Houston Methodist Lung Center program. It's a center which is located uh, in, in Houston Methodist, uh, uh, and we take care of a lot of patients with different diseases, including CTEF. So the incidence of uh, uh, CTEF in, in these patients uh, is, uh, is unknown, the exact incidence, but it's thought to be between uh, three to 30 uh, uh, patients per million based on the registry data. And uh, the burden uh, on the society is, is a lot. It's a, a lot of it is unrecognized, uh, leading to recurrent uh, ER visits, hospital admission, and a high cost, and of course, increased mortality. Now, medical management is a bridge. It's not the end goal. The, 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 the really, the main therapy for these patients is pulmonary endarterectomy or balloon angioplasty. So I'm just giving, giving a, uh, I think Dr. Ramchandani is going to go over all these uh, uh, images. So I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, suffice to say that VQ scan is the cornerstone uh, for uh, recognizing it and pulmonary angiogram is required to see. And the main uh, surgery is the pulmonary endarterectomy, which has to be done. Now, 40% of the patients approximately who were enrolled in a registry were deemed inoperable, uh, which is, is uh, 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 not a good number, but that is what we have right now. And it could be multitude of factor, including uh, impassable vascular obstruction, uh, pulmonary artery pressure, which are uh, disproportionate to the morphological lesions or lesions which are evident uh, on uh, imaging, and of course, significant uh, comorbid conditions, which precludes them from undergoing this extensive surgery or curative surgery, might I add. So multiple studies have demonstrated that these patients improve after the surgery, but patients who don't can be put on medical therapy. So we know that the only medication that is currently uh, approved uh, for um, medical management uh, of these CTEF patients is Rioseguard guanylate cyclase stimulator. Uh, it is for inoperable CTEF and persistent CTEF after the surgery, um, which is based on randomized clinical trial uh, known as CHEST-1 chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension stimulator study. Now, we also use these pH medications uh, for CTEF patients uh, as a pre-surgical medical management, but the, uh, why do we use it? Does it really have an impact on the long-term outcome of these patients? That is not known. 
Now, symptoms improve, do improve, and in patients who have post-surgical uh, residual pH, we do give them uh, this off-label use of these medications. Now, patients can also, of course, uh, undergo uh, balloon angioplasty if they are not candidate for this extensive surgery. This is the chest study, which is a primary endpoint of six-minute walk, and you can see that there was improvement of six-minute walk as compared to placebo over 16-week uh, period of time, which was the study period. And you can see that the separation between the placebo versus uh, the active drug happened early on uh, in the study. And these are the primary endpoint and the secondary endpoint. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a crowded uh, table, but uh, suffice to say that it met its uh, endpoint, primary endpoint. Also, the secondary important endpoint was reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance, which was reduced and anti-pro BNP and improvement in functional class. So pretty much a very robust uh, um, uh, results of the study that led to FDA approval of this drug. There were many other uh, medications have been studied, such as Bosantan, uh, which showed improvement um, uh, in PVR with a modest improvement or really no improvement, much improvement in walk. Chest that I went over with, with a robust improvement in walk. Uh, Messi 1010 uh, for uh, CTEF patients and also for um, uh, sub Q uh, in patients with CTEF, which also showed improvement. So uh, one uh, point I did uh, wanted to mention that anticoagulation is very important for these patients. A lifetime anticoagulation, unless there is uh, a compelling anti uh, contraindication for use it. Now, what kind of anticoagulation? Uh, you know, you know traditionally we have used uh, warfarin or coumadin, but there are the new newer oral anticoagulants. Uh, we don't know. There's no no head-to-head -head study showing which one is superior, or which one is inferior. But uh, all these patients need to be on some kind of anticoagulation unless there is a contraindication. So in conclusion, CTEF is a rare disease, uh, affects the three in 30 per million, depending on what uh, data we are looking at, associated with a high mortality. Um, uh, and you can see interestingly that only uh, uh, less than 1% to up to 5% of patients with acute PE go on to develop the chronic thromboembolic pH. The main uh, goal or the main treatment for these patients is pulmonary endarterectomy. And uh, these patients need to be referred to a pH cent uh, to a CTEF center, a pH center who have expert in dealing with these patients. And these patients, they each um, patient um, uh, studies and their assessment has to go through a uh, uh, multidisciplinary team that goes over all the imaging, all the patient's uh, uh, criteria to see if they are a candidate for surgery or not. And uh, the best option for these patients is surgery. And if not, then Riosigwad is the preferred medication uh, for these inoperable CTEF or persistent uh, pH after surgery. So medical management alone uh, confers a poor prognosis. As I said, there are no head-to-head -head clinical trials uh, looking at that, and we don't know what happens to those patients who actually refuse surgery or who have comorbidities, what happened to the long-term outcome with just medical management. But we know that it is a progressive uh, disease with a poor outcome. So I thank you for your attention, uh, and I tried to cover all this data in the five minutes that I was given. Right. Th thank you very much, Zina. That was quite uh, comprehensive. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, our uh, uh, surgeon, Dr. Mahesh Ramchandani, who is uh, Chief of Cardiac Surgery here at uh, uh, Houston Methodist and our uh, surgeon who's really pioneered our PTE program here. And uh, I'd like for him to talk about his article and also a little bit about how he put our program together here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ash, and it's great to see all of you on the on the screen. I, I think Zoom's a wonderful thing. I guess uh, the only thing about it is that we don't actually meet in person, so there are there are pros and cons. But yes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, the the article that that we put out in the in the journal was really written by Kasim Alabri, uh, who uh, and uh, and Alex Liu. Kasim is is is. Um, is doing an advanced fellowship in uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery and uh, structural heart, uh, and there's nothing minimally invasive about uh, about uh, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. But Kasim will get his hands on whatever he can, and uh, I think he and Alex wrote a wonderful article with really minimal guidance from me. So thank you to them. 
just a little bit about um, uh, about the incidence of um, of uh, CTAF and uh, and how underdiagnosed it is. I mean, the estimates vary from, uh, as Zenith pointed out, from one uh, percent to about five percent. And there have been some studies, actually, one one uh, very good longitudinal study from China that was published uh, just a couple of years ago. And you'll find the reference in the article that we wrote, where they followed patients longitudinally for about uh, five years. Uh, with with uh, with with echo and clinical assessment, which included VQ scan, and showed in fact that if you keep a close eye on these patients after they've presented with pulmonary embolism, up to fifteen percent of them at five years will end up with uh, you know with uh, with CTAF. So a grossly underdiagnosed problem. Um, a word about patient selection. Uh, uh, really, I, I, uh, as Zenith pointed out. Comorbid conditions can be a contraindication, but basically the contraindications uh, for CTEF or pulmonary thromboendarterectomy are not dissimilar to the contraindications for cardiac surgery in general. So multi-organ dysfunction, for example, you know, uh, bad kidneys, bad head, bad liver, whatever it may be, and you make your general assessment. One thing, though, which I think is... Um, uh, which does weigh more heavily in the management or the selection of patients for uh, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy is, is, is the presence of a significant parenchymal lung disease, uh, because uh, there you worry about, uh, uh, you know, how much benefit they're going to get from PTE when they have a significant pre-existing lung disease. And the other group of patients that we haven't really quite figured out uh, completely is in patients with RV dysfunction. Now, they all have some measure of right particular dysfunction. And uh, one of the earlier speakers uh, uh, talked a little bit about, uh, I think it was Sandhya who talked about uh, the use of echo and the various parameters that we use. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that it's still something that there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a sufficient uh, gray zone involved. Um, finally, um, just a word about uh, about the multidisciplinary approach that we take to this. Uh, we have, um, uh, as many centers that do this, uh, set up a a clinic where patients are seen by uh, you know by uh, by two or three of us, so that we can, in one visit, uh, make an assessment and come to some sort of reasonable conclusion. We also have uh, monthly meetings where we discuss the list of patients that are currently being considered for. Uh, PTE. Now, um, a word about the surgery itself. Uh, it, it's an operation which involves a median sternotomy and the patient's placed on cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, in, involves brief periods of circulatory arrest. Um, it's, uh, it's not difficult. One just has to be careful. I guess one could say that about any kind of cardiac surgery. And, um, if it, and, and I can show you... Uh, there is a link attached to the article uh, that we wrote, which is only available in the electronic version of the journal. Um, and um, I'll share my screen here and um, see if I can do this. And show you about two minutes of a video, which is in a YouTube link that is implanted, uh, 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 that is embedded in the article. Um, Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Very good. So the patient is lying on the table with the head to the left and the feet to the right, and an aortic cross clamp is applied and cardioplegic arrest is achieved. And then we separate the um, aorta, which is there, from the superior vena cava, which is at the bottom of the screen, so that the right main pulmonary artery is now running up and down over here. You make an arteriotomy in the pulmonary artery the right side in this case, um, and, uh, and uh, begin the dissection. Uh, I think uh, the most important part of the dissection is the beginning, uh, because establishing the correct plane is really important. And uh, you want to get in the plane between uh, the chronic thrombus material and the true intima, because if you get into a subintimal plane, uh, there is a significant risk that you'll go 
too deep, and then you'll be left with a very friable uh, adventitia uh, uh, um, around the pulmonary artery, which is uh, uh, which is liable to uh, uh, to to perforate and bleed into the lung parenchyma. You can probably see that the dissection is proceeding uh, really with uh, a combination of traction using special uh, forceps um, and. Uh, and a suction device, and you really have to be quite patient. And for the initial part of the dissection, where we're dissecting the main pulmonary artery uh, and the upper lobe on the right side, and uh, and uh, 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 a part of the intermediates, uh, one doesn't need to use circa rest. But as you get down into the lower lobes, and you're and you're looking here down uh, into the right lower lobe, you can probably appreciate the segmental uh, branches that are being teased out. This is being done under circulatory arrest, and uh, 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 the patient's body temperature has been cooled down to 20 degrees centigrade. And you see how it provides a bloodless field, uh, which allows uh, one to uh, uh, remove uh, the the uh, the uh, thrombus material. Um, now, uh, uh, once you've done that, uh, the main risks of doing this are of going too deep. And of course, you don't want to be looking at lung tissue from here, because that means that when you reperfuse, you will end up with pulmonary hemorrhage, which can be a disastrous complication uh, to deal with. So then you close up uh, uh, the, uh, the right uh, PA and, uh, and you turn your attention uh, to the left side. And here, uh, the, there's an incision being made in the, in the left main pulmonary artery, um, uh, which is then um, exposed, and you go through a similar routine. In general, I have found that dissecting on the left side is a little bit easier than doing it on the right side. And you see there, I abandoned that plane because I felt I was too deep. And then you simply find another place to begin the plane. It's so crucial that you're in the right plane. Once you are, you can be fairly aggressive and move down uh, to, uh, to uh, complete uh, the dissection uh, that you're looking for. And here's an example of a specimen from that particular case. Uh, and then the patient is simply weaned off cardiopulmonary bypass and, um, and uh, a routine closure of the chest is performed. Now, this is an example uh, of a specimen. I don't know if you can see it, um, um, I, uh, uh, which is uh, basically a resected specimen in a patient who had a completely uh, occluded uh, right pulmonary artery, arterial system. And this was a flush occlusion of the right main PA as it, uh, um, I, I, as it took off from the main trunk of the PA. And this is the specimen from the left side, which uh, in addition to this chronic component had a deeply um, uh, ulcerated component over here. This was a patient we did relatively recently uh, who also, uh, who also did, uh, did, uh, did very well. Um, so, you know, these patients can be a challenge uh, to manage postoperatively everything from reperfusion uh, injury, uh, which can involve uh, prolonged ventilation. In the occasional patient, they may even need to be supported on ECMO uh, for a short time. And we explain all this to the patients ahead of time uh, so that they know going into it that this is all part of the spectrum of possibilities that may be used to support them. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've been very fortunate. Our, our outcomes have been very good, uh, uh, not perfect, but I think the team approach that we take, and I, and I haven't mentioned uh, how important it is to have your intensivists, your anesthesiologists and perfusionists all on the same page. And uh, what we did before we started the program was take everybody over to San Diego um, uh, to, uh, to visit with uh, Mike Madani and Bill Auger as he was there at the time. And uh, they've been very supportive in helping us restart our program because we actually had a very busy program here uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s that Rafael Espada and Adani Frost uh, 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 used to run and had pretty high volume. So as an institution, uh, very familiar with what needs to be done to manage these patients. And I'm, and I'm very, very pleased that we've uh, been able to restart this program. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Ramchandani, if I may add, uh, it's it's great that we have a combined uh, CTEF clinic at the Houston Methodist Lung Center where we see patients. And as you mentioned, all these patients are seen together with uh, with the cardiology, uh, pulmonology, 
uh, cardiothoracic surgery all at the same time and then we have a monthly meeting where all the cases are discussed with the radiologist and the intensivist and anesthesia as required to formulate a plan and to make sure that each patient has the workup that's required before they go into the surgery and they are the appropriate candidate for the surgery. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mahesh, and that was a wonderful presentation. And I want to thank every single one of the presenters. Uh, you have been fabulous. You been able to present difficult concepts in a short time and the hour goes fast, but um, I'm very pleased with the way everything has been presented and particularly with the quality of this issue. So those of you who are listening to us, obviously you got a flavor of all the information that is available here. Um, you can go online, journal.houstonmethodist.org and visit with the journal and spend more time through all these wonderful articles. Uh, this is an area that many practicing cardiologists, we have to learn more about it. So I'd like to thank again uh, my co-editors, uh, Ash and, and, and Sandeep. Thank and you. the time goes fast, so uh, thank you for uh, you listeners to be with us. And the next issue of the journal is going to be on cardiovascular prevention and we already have a date of October 7 for a webcast on that particular issue. Miguel, right. I, I just have to say something. The cover of the journal that you just showed is an artist's rendition of this exact specimen. And I think the artist did a, did a wonderful job. Put, uh, hold up the magazine again so that you, you, it's, it's really a drawing. It's a, it's a painting of this particular specimen, which I thought was a uh, 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 was a great idea on your part. Well done. Thank you. Thank Good you. evening. Good night. Thank you.